Welcome to episode number 62 of the Road to Cinema podcast, featuring Oscar-nominated filmmaker Douglas McGrath of the new documentary Becoming Mike Nichols, which recently premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and which will premiere on television on Monday, February 22nd at 9 p.m. on HBO and which will also be available on HBO Go and HBO Now. Becoming Mike Nichols is a documentary that analyzes the early career of the Oscar-winning, Emmy-winning, and Tony-winning director who would go on to make The Graduate, which featured Dustin Hoffman in his breakout film role. The documentary explores Mike Nichols' early work as an actor, teaming with Elaine May to develop An Evening with Nichols and May, which would work on Broadway, as well as in a record which would go on to win a Grammy Award. The film then explores Mike Nichols' early career as a stage director, working with prominent writer Neil Simon on Barefoot in the Park and The Odd Couple, and then delving into the first two feature films directed by Mike Nichols, both of which would earn Mike Nichols an Oscar nomination, the second of which would earn Mike Nichols the Oscar. The first being Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, adapted from the Edward Albee stage play, featuring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burden, and then the iconic film The Graduate, featuring Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft. Filmmaker Douglas McGrath shares with us his concept for the documentary, delving into only the early part of Mike Nichols' career, but the part that defined him as an artist on stage, screen, and in television. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, to read the Road to Cinema blog, and to watch our Road to Cinema YouTube series, please visit jogroadproductions.com. And don't forget, you still have a chance to win a free download of the final draft screenwriting software, but time is running out. Follow us on Twitter at jogroad, follow us on Instagram at jogroadproductions, like us on Facebook, Jog Road Productions, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Jog Road Productions, as well as write us a nice review on the iTunes podcast page under the Road to Cinema podcast. Do all of the above and you'll have a chance to win a free download of the Final Draft screenwriting software brought to you by Road to Cinema and our friends at Final Draft. And now we join Oscar-nominated filmmaker Douglas McGrath as he shares with us his process behind making the new documentary, Becoming Mike Nichols, which premieres on television on Monday, February 22nd at 9 p.m. on HBO, and which will also be available on HBO Go and HBO Now. You know, you made a documentary previously about Jerry Weintraub, which covered his entire career, where you spoke to many different people. Uh, who were important in his life. So I was curious, stepping in to do a film about Mike Nichols, uh, what was your conception as far as uh, focusing on the very beginning of his career and really using uh, Mike himself as the uh, main storyteller? You know, um, it's funny. Uh, when we when we sat down with Mike, when Jack O'Brien sat down to ask him these questions, we did it over three days, and Jack asked him everything meaning he asked about all aspects of Mike's career, theater, film, TV, everything. But it was obvious that the area Mike most wanted to discuss and and the area that he discussed with the greatest enthusiasm and detail and affection and, and observation were the early years. I don't know why that was, but, you know, he was 83 when, when I made the film. He might have been looking back a little, as people tend to do, I don't know. But um, in a way, it was really, I think it was Mike who guided me there. Um, I never wanted to make a film, I will say, where we had other people come on and talk about him. That made sense in in Jerry Weintraub's story, because the other people had such um, hilarious and fantastic things to say about Jerry, and it fit the subject of Jerry. But in Mike's case... I had an unusual and I thought rare opportunity to have the artist himself really let us inside his thinking, what his choices were. And I thought that was more interesting than having either other people pop in and talk about him or to have him try and cover the whole career. Because when you have a career as long as Mike's, with as much in it as Mike's, if you do a documentary and try to cover all that, you can't stay on anything for very long because you have to hurry on to the next thing and because he spoke at such length 
and had so many insights into the making of The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and his early career with Elaine May and Neil Simon. I thought, well, let's stay where the good stuff is. And he liked the idea. I told him that's how I was thinking during the editing process. And he was very enthusiastic about it. Yeah, and it seems that um, his process that really defined his entire career, uh, whether it be how he worked with actors, how he uh, worked in a stage play environment or in a, on a film set, it was really defined by those early experiences, by that early part of his career that really influenced the rest of his uh, career from that point on. I think that's right. And also, um, Jeffrey, the, one of the things that you kind of notice when you study people, meaning artists like this, in many ways, the most interesting period is the beginning, because the, the beginning is when everything, it, it, that is the period of discovery. That's where you discover things about yourself, about your art, about other people, about how to work with other people. It's when you start, um, it's when you really start learning. And then at a certain point, a lot of people take what they've learned and then they just apply it over and over again. Well, to hear about the the application of something that's something that someone has already learned over and over again isn't as interesting to me as hearing about the discovery of how he learned those things and how and how he learned them sometimes through success and sometimes through failure. Um, I thought that was a more interesting. Um, uh, it, it's a more interesting period in in someone's life. Yeah, I was curious. But it's just like, look how right I am. I did it again. Yeah, I was curious, um, for you, did you have a personal friendship with Mike uh, that spanned over a course of time? Or what was sort of your uh, initial relationship uh, at the very beginning of uh, starting to film these interviews? I had met him a few times through the years here in New York at different events, but we weren't friends. We didn't know each other that well. Um, and then the minute we started doing this, I was subjected to the famous nickel's charm which is like a sort of sun lamp coming on and you know he comes toward you he has the most wonderful smile he has a he has a great personal magnetism which he has used to to his benefit and to the benefit of many people for for many years and you just think oh my god i'm standing here with mike nichols i can't believe it and and like many great people uh he doesn't lord that over you. He's, I'm sure he's conscious of who he is and who I am. But he, he doesn't lord it over you. He just um, kind of makes you feel welcome. And it's, it's both flattering and exciting. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Jack O'Brien, uh, who we see in the film as uh, the person who's interviewing Mike through uh, most of the film and who's a uh, very prominent stage director, um, what was their relationship and... Uh, I was just curious about the choice of using him as the uh, interviewer for the film. You know, Mike and Jack had been friends for a long time. In, in, in typical Mike style, Mike had gone to a play that Jack had directed on Broadway. I don't remember what the play was now. It was a long time ago. And one of Mike's gifts, and one of the reasons so many people were devoted to him, was that he was um, very generous in his enthusiasm. And he was very generous in sharing that enthusiasm. And it wasn't just between himself and other giant talents that he already knew. If he discovered, uh, by, by which I mean for himself discovered or first experienced the talent of another film director, of an actor, of a theater director, he would seek them out and tell them. And so he came to whatever this play was, and he uh, went backstage to congratulate the actors, and he met Jack, whom he wanted to meet, so he could tell him how much he loved what Jack had done. And they struck up a friendship, and they started seeing each other, you know, for lunch and for dinner and things. And, in fact, the whole film really happened because of Jack, because Mike had agreed to write his autobiography for Knopf, and for whatever reason, he couldn't do it. It just... I don't know. He, I don't know if he couldn't find the structure he wanted, if he didn't have the time to do it. But you know, when he and Jack would have lunch, Jack was always like, "How's the book coming? How's the book coming?" Because he was eager for Mike to get down these stories. And when Mike told him, "You know, I'm not going to do the book. I just can't. I, I just can't do it." Jack was very upset because he thought that's a lot of good stuff that's about to go unrecorded, and a lot of insight into how some great work was created that's not going to go recorded. So. Jack mentioned it to Alex Witchell, who's a writer, who is married to Frank Rich. And Alex immediately told Frank, and they all sort of thought, well, what about a documentary? 
And uh, Frank has worked for HBO on and off through the years and is producing Veep for them now. So he went straight to Richard Plepler, who's the head of the company, and Michael Lombardo, and said, guys, what about a Mike Nichols documentary? And right away they were like, yes. And, and it was kind of always uh, proposed or considered as something that he would do with Jack. And I think it was something that made it appealing to Mike because I think he knew Jack was, obviously knew he was an old friend, but he knew Jack wasn't going to ask him things that were foolish or that he wasn't interested in discussing. And if, and if Jack did ask him something he wasn't interested in discussing because they were old friends, he could not discuss it. You know, it wasn't, he didn't have to worry. He, he could be open and, and easy with Jack. So that's how that all came about. Uh, did you and Jack collaborate as far as what questions would be asked or what direction uh, sort of the interview would go in? We did um, both Jack and I and Frank at different points before shooting began met and talked about questions. Jack, I think, really wrote the bulk of the questions himself, but, you know, there would be either issues or questions that Frank and I had that we would suggest, and, and Jack folded those things into what he did. Also, sometimes when we were shooting, we would take a break, and we might suggest that Jack not forget to raise something, or we'd have a new idea that we would uh, float for him to ask, and he would do that. I was wondering, uh, going into the editing process, because I'm sure that you had so much material from these interviews, um, were there any sort of conceptual changes as far as what you originally wanted to focus on that shifted once you started editing, things that you wanted to cut out or uh, maybe you wanted to emphasize more of? That's a very good question. You know, it's funny because in, in this case, with the Jerry Weintraub documentary, I went in with a specific idea of what I thought the film should be because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, um, I thought it was helpful to know what I wanted in that particular case because we were going to shoot over many weeks and I didn't want to, if you don't have some idea, you can sometimes, you know, you I could spend four years on that documentary um, and I couldn't afford to spend four years on that documentary. So um, in Mike's case, funnily enough, I had no idea. I just knew that going in, Jack would ask him about everything. We, we all kind of agreed, Frank and Jack and I, we weren't really interested in Mike's personal life except in as much as he wanted to talk about it or, or in as much as it um, uh, had something to do with the work. But it was always conceived as a documentary that uh, would put the focus on his work as an artist. So in that way, we kind of had ruled that, the, the personal side out, as not being what we wanted the focus of the film to be. But other than that, it was whatever he said was going to be our guide. And... When I got into the editing room with my editor, Camila Toniolo, we were, it was pretty clear early on that the best material was the early material, meaning the early uh, years of his career. And you could see such a difference in his manner and in the details with which he, uh, which he provided uh, when he spoke about the early stuff as opposed to the later stuff. He was always very polite about everything. He never said anything negative or bad about any of the other projects. He just didn't ha go into much detail about them, except when we t when he was asked about Elaine um, and the Nichols and May period, when he was very excited to talk about his early work with Neil Simon and what he tried to figure out about becoming a director. And then again with the first two films, because they were substantial challenges, the first two films, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and The Graduate. And they were also very different from each other. So it wasn't like he could naturally apply everything he'd learned from the first to the second, because the tones were so different. Um, that's where his enthusiasm was. And it became clear to us in the editing room that that's where it was. So then we just thought, well, that's it. That's where, that's how we should shape it. Yeah, it's interesting, um, you know, during that time, the 60s, uh, you know, and before that, uh, 50s, 40s, 30s. In Hollywood, a lot of the directors were coming from Broadway, they were coming from theater, uh, where now it's not as common. Uh, sort of, you know, Orson Welles, you know, you think of, you know, he had a huge theater background, George Cukor, Vincent Minnelli. Um, it was just interesting watching the film to see someone who 
you know, had, was sort of steeped in theater and theater acting, theater directing, who brought that to film, but who sort of, you know, you know, sort of took all the conventions of film and flipped them and w wanted to do innovative things and wanted to think out of the box. Um, that's sort of something that you wouldn't think of that a theater director would do, but Mike was really defined by that. Yes. You know, he, um, he's almost, I, I'm, I might be wrong about this, but he's kind of the last of the guys who started in the theater who went into the movies. Maybe I'm forgetting guys that have done it since then, but the, the thing that's distinctive about Mike in this way and it's very much different from the people you mentioned. It's different than Cukor and Minnelli and so many people who started in the theater. Often when people started, mostly, in fact, I think, when people started in the theater and then became movie directors, they stayed movie directors. Um, but Mike didn't. He, he always did both. Uh, in that way, he was most like an idol of his, Elia Kazan, who also did tremendous work in the theater and tremendous work in the movies. Um, but in Mike's case, he just never, I think he never lost the love of it. And it, and it may be, I don't know why it is. I mean, it may be something very simple, which is that he just simply liked doing both. And maybe the change in form refreshed his interest um, in both forms, you know, so because the theater is one kind of challenge and you can't solve things the same way you can in a movie and vice versa. So that may have kept life interesting for him. But he's one of the few people I know who continued it uh, to go back and forth. Yeah, and then of course there was a, I believe there was like a period of time maybe from the mid-70s into the 80s where I think he was pretty much dedicated only uh, to theater. And then I think he eventually came back with uh, Silkwood. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I was but wondering... once he came back, he, then he kind of went back and forth again. Yeah. Um, I was wondering for you, um, you know, as a filmmaker, what have you picked up from Mike that you think is really essential that uh, can really be beneficial to other filmmakers out there, uh, whether it be working with actors, uh, technical point of view? Well, that's a really good question. You know, what, I think the thing he talks about the most that was so interesting was he makes the, the, the link between the work he did as an improvisational actor, and that work being essentially that you go out on stage open to what's going to happen um, because you're improvising you have to be open to what's going to happen otherwise it's not improvisation and you discover wonderful sometimes thrilling sometimes not so thrilling things when you uh, don't have everything planned um, it leaves you open to the possibility of things you didn't expect or to happy accidents or um, other things that may be very wonderful for your work that's what you do in improvisational comedy and acting. And he took that idea with him into directing, which is an unusual idea for directing. And and I think it's, and it's kind of scary. He talks about how terrifying it is. And you know, as a director, because you're always on, you know, you have a schedule and uh, everyone's very alert to the schedule. And so you tend to, I tend to do a lot of planning so that you're not stuck. But I think the thing I learned from Mike was you want to do a certain amount of planning. He certainly did a lot of planning. But you don't want to overplan. You want to leave yourself open to some kind of magic that might pop up all on its own. Because, you, you know, you can't, we all know this from life, you can't plan everything. Um, so you might as well leave yourself open to the possibility that something new and more interesting may present itself. Yeah, especially, uh, you know, you look at the, the ending of The Graduate, which Mike talks about in the film, uh, that was really, you know, because of, you know, leaving that open, you know, you could have just said cut and we would have never had that moment where Dustin Hoffman and Catherine Ross are just completely, uh, you know, puzzled and, you know, we've put our own interpretation on that. That's right. It's really interesting. I, I had seen The Graduate many times through the years and had loved it, but I'd never thought of, I mean, and the ending had, had always struck me because... The, what the ending does that's so brilliant is that it, if, you, if you'd gone with the ending, if he'd gone with the ending, which is what you think of as this sort of trite uh, romantic comedy ending, which is that they escape the evil parents, they run onto the bus, they run to the end of the bus and sit down. All the people on the bus are turning and looking at them like, what the heck are you people doing? And they burst out laughing. You could easily go out on that, and that's the big happy up commercial ending 
And what's so interesting is that by leaving the camera running like that and letting them settle and then, and then not cutting, just staying on them and watching how their faces change and start to contemplate what they've done, it makes the, the entire movie so much deeper and more surprising. I mean, it's just brilliant. And, and I hadn't known, I always assumed that was part of the script, that that was part of the calculation from the beginning. So it's wonderful to, to know that, in fact, it is a was a surprise, uh, that it was unplanned. And it, and it entirely supports his idea that um, being open to these things um, will, uh, can bring you something wonderful. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, sort of looking at Virginia Woolf, one of my favorite scenes from that is the incredible uh, Richard Burden monologue uh, that's talked about in the film, uh, which you know got underexposed, but which actually I think still looks you know beautiful uh, with Richard Burden in the shadow, and he's giving that long, long monologue, and it's you know incredible that he didn't win an Oscar for that, but uh, I just know. a brilliant scene. I know, you know, he is so great in the movie. As you know, she famously won the Oscar for it and is and is quite wonderful in it. But having seen the movie a few times before I worked on the documentary and then a couple times as I worked on the documentary, the really knockout performance of the movie is Burton's. I mean, taking nothing away from her or anyone else in the movie, he is just sensationally detailed and self-loathing and and pitiable and vicious. I mean, there's so many things he has going on. It's, it's, I think it's an extraordinary performance. Yeah, I think because Elizabeth Taylor was just so sort of out there with hers that you sort of, sometimes you can miss the subtlety of what uh, Burden was trying to do. I agree, and I also think it's because uh, possibly for the first time in her career, she kind of de-beautified herself. So, you know, that always <laughs> is attractive <laughs> to Academy voters when someone gorgeous, uh, you know, puts a little mud on her chin. They think, oh, my God. Now, I'm not saying that's all she did. She's giving a sensational performance. But she has a real physical transformation in the movie that he doesn't have. You know, she, people, she was the epitome of, of glamour for people. And in this, that's not what, what she went for. And it's, it's entirely to her credit that she fully committed to it. 